Welcome back, Controls Champions, to another episode of the Breen Machine video blog. Today, I'm back with Thad again, and we're going to be talking about the different types of Omron PLCs that you can choose from. And this is, people ask me all the time, how do you know which PLC to choose? And by having a lineup like this, I think we're going to be able to start to answer that question for you. So, let's jump right in. So, Thad, I know we're going to be talking about four different main models of PLC here. Uh, why don't you give us a quick idea of what we're going to be looking at? Sure. So I guess the first thing I want to do is kind of build a little, I guess, a little uh, background so you can kind of understand how we are where we are today. Uh, so the first thing I want to mention is the family of products that we're going to be talking about are what are called Omron's SysMac platform. So SysMac is a term that Omron came up with back in the 1980s for their controllers. And that SysMac term is short for what's called System Machine Control. So what that is basically doing is Omron has rebranded that name now. And they've come out with technologies that they're kind of putting under a technology umbrella that they're calling a SysMac umbrella. Um, within that SysMac umbrella, they have re released a number of what they call machine automation controllers or what they call Macs. Uh, the concept behind it is, you know, historically we've had the PLC, then we've had the PAC, Pro Programmable Automation Controller. Omron's kind of come out with what they call a MAC, a Machine Automation Controller. And the concept behind that is they want to have the, the means to control the entire machine. Uh, so within the SysMac world or umbrella, they're looking to control the entire machine. So focusing specifically on these MAC controllers, uh, Omron historically had come out with uh, a number of uh, previous generation products that had very defined memory locations uh, to move into the, I guess, the, the modern world, right? Uh, Omron came out with uh, the first generation of their, what they called their NJ processor line. So this NJ processor line, you'll notice that the modules themselves are slightly larger than what you might see in the other products here. And the reason for that is they didn't want to abandon the previous technology that had already been created, already been implemented, already installed by a large number of customers. So what they did is allowed the customers to use the existing modules from the previous generation of, of processors. So that allows them a migration path that isn't as painful. And from this point, Omron came out with the next item. So this particular uh, machine automation controller, this is called the NJ501 that they initially launched. Uh, this NJ501, uh, what it's uh, capable of doing is handling up to 64 axes of motion control. It can do database connectivity directly and it can handle uh, scan times that uh, by default are up to uh, one millisecond. Um, in scan time. So when I'm talking about the scan time, sorry to dive into the weeds here, but uh, what that basically means is that it is a ceiling scan time, meaning everything must happen prior to reaching that one millisecond. If it goes beyond that, that's where we start running into problems. So this is a one millisecond scan processor. This was the first generation of the uh, SysMac machine automation controllers. Then they moved into the lower end of the processor offering um, with an NJ, but they also needed to move into the uh, um, brick style offering as well. So this is for your smaller machines. Uh, this is called Omron's NX1P. Uh, with this, we have a means to do up to 16 EtherCAT nodes. Uh, this particular series does not support any uh, databasing functionality but just like all of the other processors within this family, what you also have within this is a, a means to do what we call motion at the core. Uh, so you'll notice that there's no additional modules needed to do motion control. It is handled on board the main processor itself. So the processor on board is handling all logic and motion control. Uh, so it's very efficient what it can do. Uh, this particular unit is uh, very cost effective for what it's doing and it also uh, has a uh, two millisecond scan time. So not a whole lot slower than what you're going to see in the in the bigger dog here, uh, but what you're getting is uh, a, a lot of functionality and control for your smaller machines. And then a means to jump into the next generation is uh, what is called the NX102. That is this processor right here. And this particular processor uh, supports the NX series slice I.O. modules. 
Here's a small sampling of what these look like. These little slice modules, we'll go into detail on those shortly. Uh, but what, uh, what you're going to find is that the NX1P supports up to eight of these modules next to the processor. The NX102 supports up to 32 of those next to the processor. Uh, with this, you also have a means to get out to 64 EtherCAT nodes. So you have 64 EtherCAT nodes and then on board the physical processor itself, you're going to notice three RJ45 ports on them. Now, what's kind of unique and fun is they came out with an angled version of this that actually makes it very easy and uh, uh, easy to connect. You won't have to have as deep of a panel to handle your Ethernet connections. Um, the top two ports are Ethernet IP ports uh, by label, but they can also do what's called Ethernet ASCII. And this is true on all of the processors. So what uh, is very beneficial about that is it's very, very easy to communicate with almost anything you can find in the industry. Um, if it does not, does not support Ethernet IP, which a large percentage do, the Ethernet ASCII is definitely a fallback option and it is very capable of doing that and very successfully able to do that. And we have a large number of uh, customers that can uh, also corroborate that story. <laughs> um, so with this particular unit, you're gonna have a means to do, uh, again, motion at the core and you can get up to four um, axes of motion in the lowest offering uh, the lowest I guess model and then you would go four six eight and twelve servo axes based off of the specific need that you would have so those four axes of motion control by default are going to be what are called position control axes you're going from point A to point B or you're doing a rotary table from point A to point B no coordinated motion uh, if you do need coordinated motion you would simply move up to the next larger uh, brother to this that would then have dedicated motion control functionality. Um, same, same thing in the lower end model here. Uh, when you get up to the uh, NJ501 series that we originally talked about, they're all motion control axes. So with that, you're gonna have the means to do uh, all 64 motion control axes directly. Um, the one thing I do wanna point out is in dealing with uh, something like an encoder, uh, an encoder is frequently something that you're needing to follow a position on. So think of that more as something that you would need the coordinated motion, some element of following the encoder. So anytime that you're using an encoder input, that would need a motion control axis. So just things to be aware of. Uh, and the one item that is not shown here in this list is the uh, NX701. And the NX701 is, uh, I guess, the the big dog of the family. Uh, it has an i7 processor at its core and it can handle up to 256 servo axes and it can also do databasing just like the NJ501 and just like the NX102 um, but uh, it, uh, it's for very very fast processing so granted there's not as many customers as you would expect that would need that many servo axes so why would somebody conceivably, conceivably want to do something like that and what we're finding is that customers need very very fast processing and that particular model can get down to 125 microsecond scan time again that ceiling scan time not to exceed that is very fast in the industry now this is all of the omron sysmac platform um, if we need something that is yet more powerful, um, we can certainly get into CNC-based controllers in the NJ501 family. We can also do robotics uh, on board uh, these as well. Uh, so there are kinematics built in the NJ501 as well to do scares as well as deltas and uh, articulated um, HBOT, TBOTs as well. Uh, but you can also now do um, an ability to control uh, scarer robots, so low-cost uh, scarer robots. Um, where you can do all of the code within a processor, a very cost-effective processor. Um, as an example, we have a customer doing eight servo axes and they have two robots and all of the code resides in this one processor. The robots have zero code in them. It makes it a very, very cost-effective, very powerful tool. That's fantastic. So, and instead of having a, a giant robot controller exactly. that you have to program and everything, teach pendant, um, I'm not a big fan of teach pendants, if you didn't know that. Um, now you get it all in one interface and you just got servo drives instead of that big box. Yep. Easier to mount inside yep. your control so panel, you can do it both easier ways. To, <laughs> to manage yep. from an engineering perspective. So, well. so in fact, it can handle both, uh, both approaches. Um, with the NJ501, you can do it where the servos are exactly like you're saying, the method of motion control or you can also do it where there's libraries available to those that have a dedicated uh, control box. Yes. 
So it can handle both approaches, and it's very capable of both. So a shout out to Amron for using uh, the Intel i7 in their higher end stuff, for using a, a chip that exists all of these are Intel chips. Universally. So <laughs> so what, what other kind of chips do we They're have in Atom this? chips. Atom. Yep. Fantastic. So uh, for those of you who don't know, historically, um, PLC have, PLCs have used custom ASIC chips. They've used um, sometimes the older PLCs were these tiny little chips like you wouldn't even find in a calculator anymore. And this is one of the reasons why PLCs haven't historically been very powerful. Now, when they went from the PLC name to the PAC name, they started to use, again, these custom ASICs and things that were more powerful. Um, but if something is custom, it's more expensive and it's harder to find. And so now that PLC manufacturers are starting to move to standard chipsets like you find in a computer, it drives the price way down. You get to take advantage of all the volume uh, from the computing industry and all the research that Intel and AMD and, and these other humongous companies have been doing for video games and everything else. You get a lot of power for not a lot of money. And I think this is a fantastic trend and I hope to see it continue. Well, and, and on top of that, it's going to make that future migration almost seamless for future uh, generations of products. So it's it's a very, very intelligent approach. <laughs> yes. Future proofing. Huge. Yes. <laughs> And, uh, you know, sometimes it's frustrating the way uh, Windows goes from one version to the other and software isn't cross-compatible, but for a long time now, we've been using the same architecture, the same processor instructions. And so in this kind of area where we know that we care about long-term reliability um, and support, that's a much easier thing to do, like exactly. you say. Exactly. So um, let's talk about why you would use a specific PLC for one application or another. I know I've used a few of these PLCs, and I'll point out why I used them. Absolutely. We used an NJ recently because we were updating the control system in a, an injection press, an injection molding press, and it had a lot of 120 volt stuff on it, um, common in the 30 year old machines uh, that we see. And I think this machine was significantly older than 30 years. It was. Uh, upgraded from relay logic to PLC logic at least 20 years ago. Um, so the 120 volt control common back then, these little slice IOs don't support that. And that's not surprising, tiny little compact things that they are. Um, that's always a thing we have to figure out when we're working with old equipment and upgrading it. 120 volts is a common like, ah, now I got to figure something out. So the NJ, because they're using this older style of IO module, they've also got support for 120 volts. So that was a no brainer. We used that. I also recall in the recent past, a couple of years ago, we upgraded another system and we used this brick or monolithic, I think is the technical name for it. Everybody calls it a brick uh, PLC for that. And one of the big reasons is because it's convenient to have all this IO on board. And we, I believe added a couple slices for something but it's just a nice form factor, convenient, and we didn't need a whole lot of power or speed. Um, I believe this one wasn't quite out at that time, or I made a cho might have chosen that one. Uh, Thad, how would you compare the brick versus this for a small machine? Very good question. So what I would first look at is what are we looking to accomplish with the machine? Uh, what are the I.O. count? Will there be any servo control on this machine? Um, taking those items into consideration, we now can look at, okay, so if we have a smaller I.O. count, there are no servos on this. It's almost a slam dunk. We're going to be looking at the lower end model series. However, if we have a need to incorporate several servos, um, even one servo perhaps, uh, we can start looking at the NX102 series. <clears throat> the reason for that is we can also add on a safety controller directly onto the NX102 uh, bus. And what that, that'll allow us to do is the fail safe over EtherCAT to that servo or servos. Uh, so it starts to become an all-in-one encompassing system that is all handled within one version of software. You can configure everything. It makes it very easy to configure, very easy to manage, very easy to future-proof again. It's that whole concept of make things easy moving forward. You don't want to handcuff people because then it really makes things challenging for their future. And uh, I think we've both been in that world and experienced that multiple times. <laughs> yes. I had a project one time where uh, the 
control system wasn't over designed enough to allow for future flexibility. It was one of these things we were, uh, I, I designed it, I'll, I'll take credit. Um, we were trying to make something to fill a gap between the old machine and the new machine. So it was a very temporary system, six months. And so we tried to cut costs as much as we could to support the manufacturer on that one, uh, our, our customer, not the manufacturer, the PLC. And um, as the project was being installed, we ended up finding out we needed one more drive or something, and then we didn't have enough ethernet connections available to do that thing. And it was, uh, we figured it out. We, uh, we got it fixed next day. We, uh, I'm pretty proud of how well we were able to manage the design change and the reinstall and everything, but uh, things to consider. Future proof, if it weren't a temporary project, I would have been buying something that was more than I thought I needed because that's the right engineering approach for anything. Don't ever design to minimum. <laughs> Um, I also want to note, it's it's maybe a little counterintuitive, this is a bigger case here, it's a bigger PLC. This, being smaller, is actually more powerful, has more functionality. So uh, keep that in mind, don't, don't get hung up on it. Thank you all for joining us, thank you Thad for taking us through this. Um, I think we're going to come back in just a couple minutes here and we're going to show people how to take all these apart because I think that'll be really helpful for knowing what parts you need, understanding how to maintain the systems, and understanding how to put it together in a panel and make it actually work. Absolutely. Look forward right. to it. Thank you all. See you soon. Thanks for watching. If there's one thing I like more than making these videos, it's hearing what you have to say about them. So um, leave a comment, share, like, or subscribe. Ooh.